Okay, so since I do come from the Asian Development Bank, I'm going to use a lot of examples coming out of Asia, which is going to bore some of you, and I apologize in advance. Um, actually, you know, I thought the best way to start this off would be using an, an example. Uh, so Mongolia this year uh, completed their first free trade agreement with Japan. And they did this partially, uh, you know, given the advice that we've been talking about, is that increased openness is going to lead to development. And certainly the free trade agreement increased openness in Mongolia. Is it going to lead to development? I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, and the reason is, of course, if, you want, if you're an exporter in Mongolia and you want to send something to Japan, it needs to go through China. And when there's a transit country like this, you're very dependent on what the transit country is doing. Is the border open? Are there trucks available? So um, it sort of underscores a, a problem that we face, which is that you know, trade is a condition for growth. But alone, it's not necessarily going to result in, in the magnitude of impacts that we expect or hope for. Um, and so you know, thinking about the changes over the last 30 years, uh, these have really defined what's possible to do in the development space uh, through trade and trade policy. You know, and these, these changes, as, as you heard, include things like the rise of China, global value chains, new institutions, new technologies. Um, but, you know, at multilateral development banks like Asian Development Bank, we don't always take advantage of these changes because we don't quite necessarily understand how to translate the literature into policy. Um, so in terms of uh, the panelists, I think they've done a, a good job of explaining how the framework for analysis has changed. Uh, we have better data, we have improved instruments, and we have a better grasp of what we don't actually know. Um, but is this informing policy? And so, uh, rather than sort of go through each of the, the panelists individually, I thought it would be better to sort of just think about this in terms of two questions. Um, so, and, and these are questions that we kind of face on the ground every day. These are, are we measuring development correctly? Uh, and how can we design policy to enhance the development impacts of trade? So, first. Um, are we measuring it correctly? Well, I think, you know, over the past 30 years, what we've done is we've moved to a different notion of what it means to develop. Um, and I'll just, you know, sort of an example of this comes out of our Pacific countries. Um, uh, so here, what, what we've started to do in the Pacific is focus on niche product exports. And the reason for this is because you have an extremely high cost region um, that doesn't have, that's not able to export a large volume of goods. So the only way to sort of take advantage of this is to export high value goods, right? Um, but this is not going to lead to structural transformation. So are we actually promoting development in this case? All right. Um, so I think there were sort of three ways that, that the panel talked about um, that have, where the literature has improved how we measure development. Uh, the first is in, in terms of who we measure. Um, so, you know, but what we heard is as, the, as we've sort of disaggregated the populations, um, we've seen a lot more lumpiness in gains. So, you know, this is before we were sort of looking at the north and the south, uh, but now we need to, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, different industries and different sectors within those industries and within those sectors. So that gives us a lot more sort of granular detail uh, that's very useful on the policy level. Um, the second is in terms of how we measure. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, the theory is based on relatively more developed economies. And I say this as somebody who sort of works on the Pacific, where we have very, very limited trade data. A lot of the countries don't report data. Certainly, there's no input-output tables. Um, so it's, it's a major challenge for us to sort of understand how to, how to measure. So by improving the instruments over time, which, of course, is still problematic, um, we, we've sort of overcome one of the problems, or we're moving towards improving one of the problems. And the third is in terms of what we measure. Um, and this is, again, you know, looking at new sources of data that are coming, coming available. And really, this has improved over the last five years. Uh, just in general. Okay, so that leads to the second question, which is how can policy be used to enhance the development impacts of trade policy? Um, and, you know, one thing that, that we heard was that over the past 30 years, the impact of trade on development, we've sort of learned that it's less direct than we thought. So before, you liberalize, you have development, you have growth. Um, but now, you know, we're able to sort of more precisely target policies, but at the same time, it also reminds us how difficult it is to ensure that openness is actually good for development. Um, so there were, I guess, two sort of pieces of advice um, that came out of the panel in, in terms of how we can use policy more effectively. And the first was that, you know, variations are not 
necessarily unpredictable, um, and this could be compensated. Now this kind of leads me to think about, okay, well how exactly do we operationalize this? Because com compensation is a tricky concept, um, particularly with a lot of our countries um, where you have very fluid politics. <laughs> maybe the best way to put it. Um, and the second is, you know, a lot of what the panel focused on was trade is good for development when you have certain conditions in place. But, but is this really informative at, at the sort of country level? And I think, you know, on, on one hand, um, it's positive because, you know, we can sort of say, okay, well, the, the global economy is not doing great, but countries still do have this ability to move forward. Um, if they fulfill this number of, of uh, certain conditions. Um, but in terms of, of specific policy, what exactly does this mean? And so the, the last speaker, for example, was, was talking about infrastructure. Absolutely. I mean, I come from Asian Development Bank. That's most of what we do is build roads and ports. Um, but when you're, when you're thinking about a small country, say Tonga, right, a lot of what we do is focus on improving container trade, right? So shipping, ports. But how many firms in Tonga can actually fill a container? Very few. Um, so the logistics that we're looking at are not necessarily the correct logistics for those countries. Um, so infrastructure matters, but we need to be a little bit more precise about you know, what we're talking about. Okay, so to conclude, um, I, can, I can see the panelists getting nervous here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, just you know, sort of two quick points. Uh, the first is that you know the the impact of trade on development is basically a story about growth and jobs. Um, but what's what's problematic here is we have academia, which sort of you know uncovers the interactions. You have governments which, which create the conditions, and then you have firms which actually execute trade. And this all happens in a very disconnected way, uh, and it tends not to sort of really have any any. The populations don't inform each other. Um, and, and so this kind of raises one final topic that I just want to bring up, which is trade finance. Um, and I, I think this is quite interesting because trade finance is one of the most important things that firms need, particularly firms from uh, countries that don't have sort of country ratings or sovereign ratings. Um, because what happens in that case, you can be a developing country exporter, say you come out of Pakistan, right? You have a buyer in say the US, and the logistics is in place, you have the goods, you can't, you can't necessarily sell it to them because your bank has no uh, relations with the bank in the US. Um, so what we found in a recent survey uh, is that in 2015, the shortfall of trade finance globally was uh, $1.06 trillion. And so what this means is there's about $1 trillion of global trade that's completely foregone, simply because of a lack of trade finance. Um, so I think you know this is this is something that I would like to see more in the literature. Um, but you know when you think about trade finance, it tends to be the finance part of it, and and trade economists tend to kind of ignore this, except in periods of crisis because that's when everybody's interested in this kind of stuff. So to conclude, um, I just kind of want to echo um, some of the other panelists in in terms of you know what do we do next? Let's be creative. I mean, let's think about what's missing. Um, We've, we've seen the, the changes over the past few years. Small changes have huge impacts in how we understand trade. The rise of China, the rise of global value chains, the global financial crisis. So we need to, lead to, we need to be a little bit more nimble um, in terms of how we're, we're doing the research and how we're connecting research with policy. And I think this is certainly something um, that everybody in this room could get behind and, and can certainly help us going forward. Okay, done. <laughs> particularly for bringing us back down to earth. I mean, it's very good for academics to be reminded that uh, they think they're terribly useful, but in practice, we may not be quite as useful as we think we are. Uh, so thank you, Elisa, for that. Well, we have uh, half an hour for, due to my draconian uh, production control, we do have half an hour for discussion. Um, and I thought we'd start by taking some breath. I'd like to take, I know this might sound nasty, but I would like to take, first to take questions from people who are claimed to be under 40. <laughs> In other words, I'd like some questions from, I can see lots of hands of good old friends, but precisely, not only are they good, but old. But let's see if we can get some questions from 
Uh, I'm not going to ask for IDs, but you know exactly what I mean. So, uh, any, any you, you had a, you with the blue blouse, what? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, you, you have a question here. Yeah, you're in black, yeah, yes, do. Have we got any, have we got any, oh, we got a. Thank you, and thank you yeah. for some very interesting um, presentations and thoughts. Um, one question I had, which... Could you um, say who you, where oh, you're sorry. from? Uh, my name is Carol Newman, and I'm at Trinity College Dublin, and I'm also a non-resident research fellow at UNU Wider. Um, so what, my question was about trade and distribution, which was touched upon, and um, in particular the emerging literature, both empirical and theoretical, linking um, uh, trade with wage inequality, and what implications that has for um, policy um, moving forward. Uh, so that would be a particular question for Adrian. I'll, I'll take two or three. Have you got that, Adrian? Yep. Okay. Uh, next up, right over there on the corner. Your time will come. Um, first of all, it's, I want to congratulate with the, this um, at happy birthday for the Wider Institute and the, for the UN, which is the institution which is all us It's uh, here. But I have a question for the, maybe the, all of the... Um, 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 all panelists. By the way, sorry. My name is Malika Said Hajjaev and from Uzbekistan. And uh, yes, I head of the department uh, management of High School of Management. And also the EAE members, International Association for Energy Economists. So it's just a question about the trade barrier and the uh, uh, trade, regional trade. So we, um, I, I mean, we're looking for the advice about the, um, the regional trade if uh, um, they the, the have the kind of the conflict of using the natural resources. And uh, here, uh, in, in reality, is um, um, that even if you have the um, um, educated laborers, if you spend the 60% um, um, of GDP uh, for the education and the social uh, protection for the child and the uh, young uh, generation, and even do uh, investment in the infrastructure like road. I mean, we're one of the big lenders of the ADB and uh, World Bank. And doing the, all this kind of the recommendation from the, um, uh, the economist is still the region is faced the issue of the trade within the region and with the world. So it's the question is, if the, any scenario or any institution is, look, I mean, they do the research about the, what the components could support in the market, whereas the high educated people, but because they have the kind of conflict in using natural resources, it's the trade system is fully closed within the region. Okay, well, that, that, that's a useful question. I'll ask Ron to take that on, uh, if he can, in a minute. Uh, any other? No, I, I, no, 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 no. You, yes, there we are. Yeah. Uh, I'm 41, so it's a little... No, that's all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little bit over 40, no, but... Uh, people but, understood perfectly well what yeah, I meant. <laughs> frankly speaking, yeah. So uh, I, I had uh, a little... Are you from, from... from... I'm from Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that the, the real problem for the global trade for now is that the, for developing countries, we usually uh, have to base on some kind of static comparative advantage mm. by slow waste abundance of resources. Uh, and when you engage, uh, integrate in, in global market, uh, many foreign in, in, uh, investors and even the domestic investors try to exploit some static advantage like that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is how to transfer from exploit static ad comparative advantage to dynamic comparative mm -hmm. advantage. It's, that's a, the main problem because for long, uh, for over time, the ways we have to increase, uh, the resource will be exploited, mm -hmm. everything will be gone. And so what is dynamic comparative advantage? That is a productivity. Yeah, and productivity de depends on uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. in technology, and e even in institution. So that is some kind of trap. And I am very interested in the graph that by Alan, that is uh, some convex concave uh, production function that 
based on openness. That's it. I think that's a, that's way. With the convex concave function like that, so country with some guy will fall into poverty trap, even in middle income trap. So it's a pro the question is, uh, how can developing country to transit from statistic uh, comparative advantage to dynamic status, uh, dynamic comparative advantage to move up the uh, income level? Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. And, and that question, as you indicated, is, is directed to Alan. So shall we take that first round of of, of questions? That's enough for the moment. Then we'll have another round of questions in, in a minute for the... Uh, uh, for the more mature. Um, the, uh, so sh shall we start off with the first question about uh, trade and uh, wage policy and so on for Adrian? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I mean, that long list of references uh, on my last slide gives you an indication that there is a, a huge amount of work's been done on this issue, um, which I feel slightly guilty and rather responsible, but um, I... The effects, of, the effects of trade on wage inequality in developed countries are pretty clearly negative. I mean, not just trade, but globalization generally. That has tended to increase inequality, wage inequality in, develop, in developed countries. Argument about how much uh, trade has been responsible. But I think on developing countries, <clears throat> I think we would, would simply reiterate uh, the, the, the gist of what I said in my talk. The effects have been very mixed. You've got different forces pulling in different directions. <clears throat> You've got sort of standard Hexerolin forces, uh, which in some countries are going to tend to raise wage inequalities, and others are going to tend to decrease them. You've got these additional technical transfer uh, forces, um, and not just the, t the transfer of technology, but also the relocation of activities between countries, which is caused largely by the reduction, not of transport costs, which is the Hexerolin mechanism, um, <clears throat> but of barriers to the, the flow, above all, of, of information. ICT has, has, had, a, has had a huge effect. <clears throat> and so I, you've got these, and these, these, the, the net effect of these forces in different countries pulls different ways. But I'd like to underline the importance of the point that Ron made, which is, should you regard an increase in inequality between skilled and, skilled and unskilled workers as a good thing or a bad thing? Um, in the short run, it obviously makes uh, the country less equal and uh, in some sense less fair. In the long run, uh, it provides an additional incentive to invest in skills, which may be just what you need for the kind of dynamic comparative advantage emphasized by the last questioner. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Uh, Ron, there's a, a question, particularly the relationship between, as I understand it, infrastructure and education and the problem of regional trade. And market access, I suppose, is what, what the question was about. If you could address that, please. So I think infrastructure is, uh, can play a particularly important role in the, you know, in the transportation sense. So it's probably uh, if there's a lack of integration between uh, you know, different countries. In, but when you say region, are you thinking of different countries in a particular geographical region, or are you thinking of regions in one country? No, the different countries. Ah. The okay. different countries so in different region, countries, yeah. let's say, in, in Central Asia, or, but different, yeah. different countries, yes. Okay, so in that case, I think uh, uh, if there are... Everything I, I, I think every, everything I said, which was intended to be on a global scale, should apply equally well if it's a regional scale, all right? But if there are particular problems, uh, let's say geographical problems of connecting the different countries within the region, uh, then the role of infrastructure becomes uh, even more important. But we have the interesting possibility that we shouldn't only think of infrastructure as being done by each single country by itself, but the possibility of uh, you know, multi, multilateral infrastructure projects. And of course, uh, you know, the Mekong, Mekong River project is one very important example, and we could have many others also. So, I, so the way I would answer the question, at, 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 admittedly in a very unsatisfactory, a very general way, would be uh, multi uh, multilateralize the infrastructure uh, that you need to promote the trade within the region. Right? And uh, that 
Uh, and there's no reason why that shouldn't be done. Uh, I mean, infrastructure, why should, in, you know, why should dams and irrigation projects and things like that uh, stop at a political border, right? I mean, there, there could be natural, geographical, uh, you know, negative and positive externalities across borders, and there's no reason why we shouldn't plan uh, to take all of these into account. Uh, perhaps uh, the ADB has uh, already thought about these things. Maybe, maybe, uh, could you tell us? Uh, I will just take five seconds to answer that. We have thought about these things, and we, we, do, we do focus on corridors, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, it's really, really difficult to plan on a regional level, um, it, it just from a donor perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, because our countries have particular amounts of money that they get, sure. and they are not going to request that money for a regional project. They're going to request that money for a, a country level project. Um, so we need to sort of find different types of resources that can do that. It absolutely makes sense. We absolutely should. On That's the sort of a free rider problem, right? Yes. I mean, in a sense, you know, we'll, we'll let the other guy, the, we'll let the other guy put up the money since we're both going to benefit. Why should I do it? Yes. Right. Exactly. So it's a state issue. <laughs> is what's the what's the authority above the regional uh, national entities? Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, to Elisa and Ron for that answer. The, the, the third question, which I think is for, um, was for Alan, is about uh, dynamic comparative advantage. And I suppose part of the question is directed to whether endogenous growth models help us to tackle that and actually be able to formalize it and measure it or not. Um, yes, thank you, Alfie. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that the, the sort of general question of how do you get a, an economy to, as it were, move up mm -hmm. uh, to the next level it is far, far wider than just a trade policy or a trade issue. Um, I think you know, the, the point about trade is that in some sense that if you discover ways of being more productive at some, uh, in some higher level, uh, then indeed uh, the, um, the fact that you can uh, export goods, you, can, you don't have to match trade, uh, consumption and production, uh, means that you can exploit that much more fully than could um, a closed economy. Now, trade and uh, the world economy offers some help in moving towards com uh, dynamic comparative advantage in the sense of uh, you can import uh, inputs, you can import technologies, uh, foreign direct investment, and so on. Uh, but very clearly, um, countries also need uh, domestic uh, inputs and domestic structures uh, if they are to move um, uh, sort of into and then out of uh, middle-income status. And the things that Ron talked about of infrastructure, clearly uh, hard and soft infrastructure, clearly important um, education, um, and um, a climate, essentially, that allows people to experiment. Uh, I'm not uh, personally a great fan of the idea that governments are going to work out uh, exactly where you should be going and get you there. One actually wants to take advantage of um, you know, a large number of ideas, many of which will fail, uh, but some of which uh, will succeed. So I think, in a sense, it's... Um, Trade is um, a facilitator of that because it allows you to concentrate on the stuff that's going well. Um, but trade, uh, you know, open trade regime, manipulating your trade regime in any way is not, uh, I think, uh, going to be sufficient. Um, I think that's, that's really the, you know, the, the, the best way that one can think of the role of trade in that. If I may, I'd also just like to ask very quickly to make two points about the wage inequality yeah. question. I mean, first is to say there's some very interesting recent literature uh, which has observed that uh, international trade in, is, affects firms heterogeneously. Uh, you know, uh, stronger firms benefit more from trade than weaker firms. And Elhanan Heltman and a number of other people now have taken that into the labor market and observed that stronger firms want stronger workers, can indeed afford them. And therefore, there are reasons to believe that um, a trade regime might indeed increase wage inequality within a sector. Um, and that's um, you know, the sort of back of the envelope calculations, which are the best we can do against these very abstract theories, uh, suggest uh, that this might explain quite a lot of observed wage inequality uh, increase in the last 10 years. The other point to make is, in general, I mean, I've worked a lot on trade and poverty. Uh, they're moving from wage inequality 
uh, to something like poverty involves this big step of getting from individual earners to whole households, and households are um, aggregations of earners typically. And just because wages are becoming more unequal does not mean that households are becoming more unequal. Very good reminder. Thank you very much. So we've got time for a second round of questions. So uh, Deepak, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Rajiv. Um, two questions, very quickly. The, the relationship between international trade and uh, economic growth, hence economic development, um, is characterized by accumulative causation. But this cumulative causation could be virtuous and or positive, but this cumulative causation could also be vicious and or negative. Now, uh, this is a question that Ron may wish to address. It is in part about what he was hypothesizing. Now, is it then possible to argue, as Ron did, that if you create an infrastructure and spread education, which I described as the creation of initial conditions this morning, then you would be on the, the virtuous cumulative causation path. Uh, but if you look at the world around us in the past 30 years that Adrian alluded to, uh, trade liberalization was associated with a very significant deindustrialization in Latin America and a very significant threat to food security through a disruption of agriculture in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so are there sort of comparable initial conditions, say, in agriculture as an industry. That's one question. The second question, it could be for anyone in the panel, you know, there are gains to be derived from trade, okay? If it's cheaper to make a good at home, uh, more expensive to make a good at home in terms of domestic resources use than to export one to buy that good. Uh, but this is a very kind of static conception in terms of allocative efficiency criteria about gains from trade. Yes, we can accept the proposition that trade is good, but is more trade always better is the question we need to ask ourselves. Because if you link back to the questions asked a little while ago about dynamic comparative advantage, uh, if this trade liberalization or more trade happens too soon, either in terms of timing or pace or sequence, is it not possible that it might preempt realizing your potential comparative advantage. Uh, what happens then in this world to the old industry, industry argument? Lovely, thank you very much. Jose Antonio? Then the chap at the back. Yes, then, yeah. I wanted to make a question, uh, probably to Ron, but yeah. to any of the panelists. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm kind of obsessed with the, with the question uh, of whether there was a structural break uh, in the growth uh, of international trade uh, after 2007-2008. Um, after 2007-2008, after the global financial crisis, let's say. Uh, I mean, uh, according to my numbers, let's say from 86 uh, to 2007, uh, real export growth was slightly over 7% per year. And after that, it has been around 3%. It's actually falling this year. Um, so, uh, so I understand the, I mean, this has two, two issues, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, whether is, there are some structural changes in trade uh, that are happening uh, that have long-term implications for development, uh, but also uh, what is, is the development policy the same uh, with world trade growing at 7% per year or at 3% per year? Very, very challenging thought. Well, I'll come to you later, Machika. The chap at the back, yes. Thank you so much. I have a question to Ellen Winters and to Ron Findlay, and that's about the relationship, not between trade and development, but with, between trade liberalization and the share of trade in GDP. Ron referred to the trade development nexus as a very intimate one. Now, I would say this is a very this is even more intimate relationship between liberalization of trade and the increase or decrease in the share of exports or share of trade in GDP. At face value, you would think that if there are barriers between countries in trade and then you eliminate these barriers, then trade is supposed to increase naturally. 
But our experience tells us a different thing. And Alan Winters actually referred to the paper by Roderick and Rodriguez, which makes a distinction between two notions of trade openness. One is the share of trade in GDP. The other is the trade barriers. Once you take away the trade barriers, it doesn't necessarily go as the trade increases. The case in point here, there are a lot of empirical research, but the case in point is China after the opium wars, when there was full liberal, liberalization for about 100 years. And the share of trade in GDP was 3% in uh, 1850, and in 1950 it was pretty much the same 3%. And then the increase in the share of trade in GDP came after, under the very protectionist policy, 1980s and 1990s, when the input duties in China were something like 20 to 40 percent, 40, and they were going down to 20 percent to uh, input duties. I, I, as I a hate to interrupt. Could you imports. actually ask the question? That's, that's the question. Oh, the see, question sorry. is how you explain the relationship between, it seems like protectionist countries succeeded in expanding the share of trade in GDP, in increasing trade to GDP ratio much more successfully than um. the countries that were non-protectionist. And I have a short comment to Adrian Woods uh, very much related to that. And I think it is, is the comment that goes in line with his argument about the importance of other factors in explaining the increase in inequalities. If you look at examples like transition economies, for instance, uh, countries that came out of communism, why inequalities increased? Because trade was liberalized? No, it was very secondary factor. The inequalities increased because previously there was no private property and now they allowed private property. There were no financial ty tycoons and now the financial tycoons emerged. If you look at the experience of recent 30 years in developed countries with increase in the inequalities, Globalization could have been a factor, it's one of the explanations, but not liberalization of trade. Once again, trade became uh, greater between countries, uh, globalized, right? The world became more globalized, but not as a result of liberalization. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, the gentleman with the moustache there. Anyway. Uh, uh, my question to all of the members of the panel. Many developing countries are experiencing a surge of remittances. And, and remittances uh, have, have had a huge impact on the way the trade policy is managed in these countries. Uh, exchange rate management, the use of fiscal policy, the use of other trade policy instruments. Uh, I have not seen a lot of literature that looks at remittances in the larger trade context uh, and, and in the design of trade policy. I was just wondering what the thinking is on this issue. I'm just going to only take two more questions, one short one from Machiko and one from this colleague over here. So, you'll go, Machiko? You'd like a... Hi, Machiko uh, Nissan, University of London. I think uh, it's related to what uh, has been said uh, just now, but uh, I think uh, it's true that the trade is a powerful force for development and we all agree, but the trade can not necessarily universally all the time positive horses, and the trade can be really positive horses when it starts triggering process of dynamic change of comparative advantage. So trade policy has to be complex of other development policies, and particularly now, nature of trade so much changed over the last three decades, or well, if not longer, that no longer we are trading in finished goods. We are trading all in intermediate goods, and that is most world trade is inter-farm trade, inter trade and all this. So basically, having um, trade investment and uh, uh, technology, sectorial policy together in complex to support that changes is very important. And in that sense, I think Ronaldo's intervention saying that actually you need constantly some sort of public service provision. Uh, you know, you called it the A factor, but uh, you need the public goods provision to, to, be, to facilitate that process. And in that sense, you know, as I can see the difference between Asia and all this very 
a big factory Asia was cre created as opposed to other two developing regions, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, still that is not the case. Internal market forces uh, demand is fairly weak. Its difference is uh, macroeconomic conditions. I mean, it was very difficult for those countries which were dependent on uh, uh, to take stop go fiscal policy, they couldn't sustain to provide uh, that sort of public services to make it possible to trade to, to lead for development and uh, uh, you know vigorous growth path. Thank you. So I just want to know what is your position on that. That's a very useful point. And one last one over here and there we are. Okay, I have uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, I, I had a doubt, I think the relationship with, um, between trade and development is very complex. So how accurate we can, or how certain we can say when we say that trade is good or is not good for development, even though for growth. And I say that it's very complex because I, I don't think that we actually are taking it into account all the variables. For instance, in developing countries, um, all that is uh, consumption of goods that um, promote, uh, that are used for technology of information is, is very good. And I think it's a positive point for development. And uh, in some variables like this uh, should be uh, take into account. The, the another thing is about the hedgehog uh, theory. I think that uh, uh, also how accurate uh, the relationship is be between wages uh, and uh, prices. So I don't know it is um, it is a, a good uh, proxy to, um, to, to relate between Gini coefficient that is about distribution but not about the um, premium uh, of skills in between wages and trade that is the the, the value real value or uh, nominal value but it's not the relative prices that is what because the HR rolling is the this uh, effect of uh, inequality is uh, derived from the stopper Samuelson so how how I, how I, I can see the relationship between these variables was uh, very useful. Last question. I think your, 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 your panel, you have a few minutes. Each, 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 each of you would like to combine that with your last words, answering uh, as many of these points as you can. So we'll start on the left with Adrian. Thank you very much for these very nice comments and questions. I'm not going to attempt to answer them all. Let me just pick up one sort of common theme that I think runs through a lot of them and respond on that, which is don't think about trade. Can you have too much or too little trade? You know, it's been a structural break. Think about openness. That was the, that was the, uh, the independent variable on the right-hand side <coughs> of, uh, of, of Allen's regression. You've got to think about barriers to trade. And the point about the, the structural break is that, you know, the, this 30, the 30, previous 30 years were a period of Im immense movement towards integration uh, of the global economy uh, caused by a variety of things, including uh, the transition from, from uh, centrally planned economies in a large fraction of the world. Of course, that caused the, the rate of growth of trade to accelerate relative to GDP. That's, that has slowed down. A lot of that process has, has, has come to an end. So you would expect, uh, again, the, it's not a structural break. It's just there are now no longer any big openings um, uh, going on at the moment. So you know, this, the, the two aggregates are now beginning to move more in line. And I think one's just got to think about, the, and that applies also to the, to the point about the distributional effects. I mean, if you want to do a proper analysis, you've got to focus on barriers, not on trade aggregates. And indeed, you know, that's in a way the message of quite a lot of the, of the literature. So that's just one point that I think responds to quite a lot of what was said. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Alan, would you like to reflect? Yes, thanks. I, let me endorse what Adrian said, and so I won't, uh, uh, I won't go there at all. Let, let me take up um, uh, uh, three issues of policy, actually. Uh, first, um, uh, you, to, to Deepak, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, you mentioned that you know, maybe uh, we can have too much trade um, and maybe we need to intervene. What about infant industry uh, arguments? It seems to me that you know, we're it, it's fairly well established that if infant industries is a really important issue, but the failures that lead to there being problems over infant industries are essentially not trade issues. They are issues about self-discovery, possibly about capital markets, and what have you. And so I'm not moved, in a sense, to say, look, trade is the problem under these circumstances. Um, it's, you know, essentially the problem lies elsewhere. And if we focus on trade policy as an answer to infant industry issues, we actually are uh, going to uh, very largely miss the boat. Um, uh, second to, uh, to uh, Jimmy, uh, Machiko, you said uh, something that really, really gets the hairs on my neck standing up. Uh, you said you think that trade, look, the world's very complex, the world's getting more complex, so trade policy has to be complex. I, I confess I've concluded exactly the opposite. I think the point about trade policy is it ought to be simple, essentially non-negotiable, so we don't waste time negotiating it, and transparent. I, I actually think that the world spends far too long agonizing about tiny details of trade policy, negotiating with this interest, that interest, this country, that country, where in fact developing countries have got huge numbers of problems quite separate from that. So actually, I would advocate that trade policies should be made really simple, really transparent, and the people who now do trade policy should go off and do something really useful, like girls' education or making the buses run or what have you. So it is true that there might be one or two casualties, but actually I think we'd find that a simple transparent trade policy uh, would, uh, would, uh, would stand us in better stead. And then finally to each as, uh, so remittances and trade policy, and I, I don't think anyone has particularly thought about this. I think there's consciousness that remittances affect exchange rates, um, but whether that has fed into trade policy, uh, I confess I'm not aware, and uh, you, know, you prod me into saying, yeah, I ought to go away and think about that. I'm interested in both bits of that question. So I think that's a very good question to which I have no answer. Thank you. Uh, Ron? <coughs> Uh, words yes, of wisdom, I, finally. Uh, well, at this stage of the game, it's difficult to think of... I can think of words, but not, uh, unfortunately not words of wisdom. Uh, but on the remittances question, it's, uh, I think uh, you know, it fits into the Dutch disease framework, right? I mean, a very large volume of remittances uh, appreciates the exchange rate. It can, uh, it can uh, you know, damage the export sector and so on. So that, that channel, I think, is pretty... Is pretty uh, is pretty well understood. Uh, now, what you what you should do about it? That you know that that's a con somewhat controversial issue on which uh, on which we can have on which we can have different opinions. I think uh, the lady in the front, uh, uh, if I followed correctly, was saying that uh, many countries uh, find it sort of fiscally difficult to provide the infrastructure that uh, that would be appropriate. Right? I mean, is that that was that was that yeah. what you intend? Instability. Yes, 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 yes. I mean that, that is perfectly true. In in the in the model that I was uh, discussing, uh, you know, I was taking, uh, I was not having any constraint on the tax. I was saying, okay, you find out what is the optimal level of infrastructure, and then uh, I, I assume you can raise the revenue necessary to. Uh, you know, to support that level of infrastructure and whatever else the government has to do. But now, of course, but of course, I mean, if you have, you know, if there, are, if there are problems with raising taxes, if there's general macroeconomic instability, then it would be difficult to do all of these things. So that is, that's probably why, you know, we always say that if we look at the success stories, a, a degree of macroeconomic stability has always been uh, important. It doesn't have to be very, very tight money and so on, but nevertheless, if you look at the Asian Tigers, if you look at Singapore, uh, in all of those cases, <clears throat> there has been reasonable macroeconomic stability, all right, which makes it easier to adopt the right uh, policies on the on the production and on the production and trade uh, production and trade front. Uh, to uh, my friend Vladimir and the Chinese experience. 
I would have to say that the, you know, the period when China was open to free trade was also the period when there was, you know, when there were warlords and revolutions and, uh, uh, you know, invasions and all of those things. So the fact that uh, China wasn't able to do much during that, uh, during that period on the economic front, despite some successes, uh, but, you know, the fact that it was not, it was not the fault of free trade, I think, that China, China was held back during, you know, during all the time from the Opium Wars to, uh, to, the, uh, to, 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 you know, the communists, uh, to the Chinese Revolution. So that, uh, I, that's, that's the general historical issue that I would, uh, that I would raise. And uh, I'm afraid I didn't quite get the, the question about fact, about product prices and factor prices. Could you rephrase the question more narrowly? I, I think we have to draw to a close anyway, so okay. I'll All excuse right. you okay. from so that maybe one. We'll, we'll do and it I now. just wondered whether Elisa had any final reflection. No, I will leave this to the experts. Oh, but do I you know, think? I know you, everybody else wants to right, leave. Right. But, uh, Alisa, as a <laughs> practitioner, do you think you've learned? Do you think we've learned anything today? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I you know, I think what's important is, this. Um, you know, just just one question. I think you know what what we did learn is that there's a there's a pretty wide divide between what we're doing on the ground. Yeah. Uh, and and where the where the theory yeah. and the empirics are, um, which I think is is moving closer together, um, but we're still not quite there. Excellent thing. Well, I'm supposed to sum up, but I'm not going to because there's a high risk there will be no lunch left if I do so. So thank you all very much for your patience, and thank you to the panel.